Hey everybody, welcome back. This is us squeezing in one more stop before all of our light is gone. So we apologize if it gets low light before we're done. I'm Gary Edelman, that's Chris White behind the camera, and here we are at Corinth, Mississippi. We are a little bit, you know, sort of west of Corinth, and the reason we're over here is because after the siege of Corinth, which really wasn't a siege that took place in April 1862, when the Confederates are going to fall back from here, the Union came here and strengthened the place. There are some uh, works in town that were used by Confederate and Union soldiers, but here we're here to talk about when the Confederates came back. And when they came back, they came in from the west and from the northwest, and they're going to attack this place. That's why we're on this side of town. And when they attack, there's going to be a series of fortifications, Williams, Robinette, Powell, and maybe a few others that they're going to have to deal with or avoid if they can. So we're going to talk about this, a little bit about the fighting uh, right in this area, in the area of Battery Robinette, and of course to talk about that, once again, our good friend General Parker Hill's Battle Focus Tours. Well, we're right here at the monument uh, where Colonel Rogers, uh, Colonel William Rogers, was killed on the attack on the fourth day of, uh, of October 1862. Uh, the neighborhood behind us, all the houses in the distance, uh, the the uh, Second Texas uh, Regiment led by Colonel Rogers charged through those neighbor that neighborhood towards us. We would be uh, right here in the Union lines with 30-pounder Parrot rifles. Uh, we've got huge guns up here in Battery Robinette facing these men and they're putting double grape shot, a double canister into these men as they charge across these fields and Colonel Rogers will be killed uh, here at this spot he, and, and uh, this is his grave also. Uh, now the, the, the attack actually gets up into the fort but uh, the Federals had reinforcements that came and drove them back out. As the men are attacking here, other Confederate units are attacking through town past Battery Powell. They actually get into Battery Powell, take some of the guns there. Some of the Confederates will actually get into town. William Stark Rosecrans uh, will basically lose his cool uh, and order that all supplies, all ammunition be destroyed, and his commanders decide that's not necessary. They don't obey that order. Uh, the Confederates will actually get all the way to the Tishomingo Hotel before reinforcements, Union reinforcements will drive them out. One of the things that really came into play here is an entire Confederate division commanded by Mansfield Lovell off to my right, uh, to my left, up in the vicinity of the old Corinth Cemetery, never attacks. Never explained, we don't know why. And consequently, these men are just left hanging when, when the exportation of their of the success never took place. So it will end up being a very bloody day, the second bloodiest battle in the state of Mississippi, second only to Champion Hill uh, here on the fourth day of October, 1862. Uh, that will force Van Dorn to withdraw and uh, Rosecrans will wait until the next day before he orders a pursuit. And Grant will I never quite forgive him for that, but that will lead to the Battle of Davis Bridge on the fifth day of October and Van Dorn and we'll escape and get back out of the Ripley, Mississippi. Uh, that's great. Parker's making good use of this daylight that we have. Thank you so much. So there was a lot of interesting things there. One, Davis Bridge has been largely preserved by you, the members of the American Battlefield Trust. And that, you got to want to go there. You don't just happen upon Davis Bridge, but a cool battlefield um, by all means. Two, we're talking about not just a large battle, but a costly one. The Union lost 10% of their force here. The Confederates lost 20% of their force here. And only because of the battle that happened earlier that year at Shiloh, do we somehow not consider that a huge and massive battle in the Civil War? war. I mean, what kind of a war is it when losing four, five, ten thousand soldiers barely even registers in the newspaper accounts for more than a couple of days? So this is saying something about how the country is changing, um, to be sure. Um, I think it's also interesting that their Confederates are actually getting into town uh, street fighting. You usually hear about Fredericksburg for that, but here you have United Confederate soldiers in the streets of Corinth, and here we have one uh, perfectly unique thing, the only uh, version where we have Confederate dead laid out for burial but not in a grave, where somebody's actually identified and that is thought to be Colonel Rogers of the Second Texas. Uh, the gentleman next to him, one of the majors, is supposedly identified, but that one doesn't match up. This one seems to match up with what we know about Colonel Rogers. Again, there are three or four photos taken in the Western Theater showing the human carnage of battle. That's four of the roughly 104 photos that were taken showing the human carnage. And Corinth is the one place in the whole Western Theater where you can actually experience that. It doesn't mean Corinth is any more special than the other places, but it does help us to visualize it. And it's no surprise the visitor center 
was built at this site, where the Confederates almost broke through, um, and where the famous photos have taken people since then. Chris, do you have something to add? Well, and I was just thinking about what you were saying, Gary, about how this is a huge battle that hardly gets much notice. But let's look at some of the cast of characters that were here during the siege of Corinth. Braxton Bragg, for instance. Where is he in October of 1862? He's in Kentucky. Battle of Perryville happens the 8th of, of, uh, of uh, October in 1862. Much closer to north, much closer to the population centers. All eyes are paying attention to what's going on up there. And down here, you've got Rosecrans, who, look at that. He's still a wanted man in these parts. <laughs> uh, we, got, we got another car coming too, but just speak louder. We're losing daylight. <laughs> So you have a cast of characters here that is kind of like the B-team compared to what's going on up in Perryville. And of course, everyone up in the north is still uh, paying attention to the, the aftermath of Antietam. So it's little wonder that this action here takes a back seat to some of the things that are happening up north. But this is a huge, huge uh, development here for what's taking place in this theater. And it's going to open things up significantly for what goes on in 1863. I got two last things I want to talk about or address here. One of them I'll bring Parker back on for, uh, but the second of which is going to be this great interpretive center where we stand. But first, let me ask Parker, I mean, just to tie this up, because you don't hear a whole lot about Earl Van Dorn, you know, after this battle. This is October 1862, and you really don't hear much about him by the following year, Parker. Earl Van Dorn was, uh, let's politely say, a man who did not take his marital vows seriously. Uh, anybody else? He, he was already <laughs> he, was, he was already under a shadow for some of his finaglings in Vicksburg with Jefferson Davis, and uh, now Earl Van Dorn will be relieved of command. And it, of course, as, as mentioned, uh, the genius John Clifford Pemberton, uh, who was a, a, a Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, a native and a graduate of West Point, so he becomes Jeff Davis's trophy Yankee. He will take over the Army uh, with no real combat experience at all at Vicksburg. Van Dorn will be relegated to be his cavalry commander, and he will do a fine job raiding Grant uh, at Holly Springs on the 20th day of December, 1862, but he will eventually end up over uh, in Tennessee, and uh, he will fall, fall uh, to a jealous husband's bullet on the 7th day of May, 1863, for... Uh, for disturbing the sanctity of his home, is the way he described it. Good. Thank you, Parker. And I just, I'm just so fortunate. I think we're all fortunate. I hope you all feel that way. You know, with Chris behind the camera doing the awesome graphics and Chris Bukowski and Parker Hills telling these stories at these important places and that you help us preserve them. So thank you so much. Make sure you share these videos with your friends. We won't make them if enough people don't see them. It has to be worth the trip and everything like that. So please share them. Please go to battlefields.org and use some of our stuff. And if you come to Corinth, check out this incredible interpretive center here, foot for foot. I have long called this the best National Park Service Interpretive Center foot for foot in the country. They take it at the campaign level, they get down to the battle level, it's really clear, they have cool reminders of where you're standing as you even walk up. The Interpretive Center continues before you get in, while you're there, and then at the interesting water sculpture out in the back. Uh, so I think it's a highly, I highly recommend you visit Corinth and visit this great Interpretive Center, especially pairing it with a trip to Shiloh. Guys, anything to add? Oh, here comes Chris Mikowski. No, he took a step and now he's not going to. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Parker. Thank you, Don Baird, who's just hanging out right now with us. Thanks, Chris White. I wanted to talk about Earl Van Dorn some more. Okay, okay. I wanted to hear some more about him. <laughs> <laughs> but I understand that Earl Van Dorn, that after he, after he was sh shot, the doctor that killed him for good reason uh, was given a horse by the subordinate uh, command of the Confederate Army there in Spring Hill and told that the Yankee lines were 22 miles away and good luck to you. Wow. That's, that's, that that's right, and he was actually captured by the Confederates and tried in Meridian, Mississippi for the murder of Van Dorn and acquitted. Well, acquitted. we'll have plenty more on the tawdry story of Earl Van Dorn because <laughs> I think Spring Hill is on our agenda as we continue this fantastic road trip through Tennessee. We've got so much more to come in the next few days. We want you to be with us. We're having a great time. We want you to have a great time with us too. Thank you so much for being with us here in the American Battlefield Trust and thank you for supporting Battlefield Preservation. And thank you, Chris, for taking your Gary Edelman <laughs> pill. That was awesome. <laughs>